Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to attend um, this session on Connected Collections Management, Improving Efficiency and Audience Outcomes. My name is Jack Kirby, and I am Head of Collection Services for the English National Science Museum Group. And I'm Malcolm Howitt. I'm the Sales Director for Axial. So this afternoon, we're going to talk you through a case study from the Science Museum Group, how we embraced the challenge of moving 300,000 objects, um, use technology to improve our efficiency and to offer digitisation, leading to greater access to the collection online, which has become particularly relevant and useful in, in the last few months of the pandemic. Um, we'll then hear from Axial about sort of the technology that we are just implementing um, that they've supplied us with at the Science Museum Group. And there will be a chance for you to ask us questions at the end. And um, as it says in the chat, please do put questions in as we go along and we'll, we'll pick them up at the end um, or save them up um, and ask them when we've finished. So um, without further ado, let's start the presentation. Um, just to, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with the Science Museum Group, we have five museums located across England, from locomotion in County Durham to the Science Museum in London. And we also have, very relevant to this presentation, the National Collections Centre, which is in Wiltshire, just outside Swindon. And we attract over five million visitors a year to our museums. Now, we are not without challenges. Our collection um, is large and varied and sometimes um, dangerous, full of hazards, um, as is the nature of historical science and technology. And a lot of it, 300,000 objects out of a total 425,000, is located in the building that you see in the centre of the picture here, Blythe House in West Kensington in London. And in 2016, just to add to the challenges, the government announced it was going to sell that building and we would need to relocate our collections. But actually, Blythe House is far from ideal. It's um, a warren of 100 rooms in our part of the building, and we share it with the Victoria and Albert Museum and the British Museum, and we have one good slip between the three of us. So it's not how you would start off if you were designing a collection store today. Um, the access to the Science Museum Group's collection at Blythe House has historically been poor, and um, we also have not actually had a great catalogue um, of exactly what is in there for ourselves, so lots of undocumented objects, which I'm sure will be familiar to many museum people. Um, and when we started this program, we only had 5% of our object collection online with an image. And that was pretty poor compared to art collections where significantly more is online. So we decided to see this as an opportunity. We've got to move the collection and we can take it somewhere better. And we can also make it more accessible as we go so that instead of this um, collection crammed into tiny storerooms, we, could, we can open it up and make it accessible both physically in new premises and online. And this next slide shows where it's going. This is the National Collection Centre in Wiltshire, and we're building an absolutely massive building here, 33,000 square metres internal area, and that is enough to house 600 double-decker buses, just to give you some idea of scale. Um, it will house the collection that's coming from London, but it will also house collections that are in life expired buildings that are on the site um, in Wiltshire already. It's a former airfield um, and the original buildings on it are aged and um, we, we need to move out of them as well. And the building will enable us to give better access, conservation and digitisation facilities for our collection. And it's also low energy, so it's going to be a real improvement. And it's nearing completion. I'm going down there in a couple of weeks time and I'm really excited to see um, how it's getting on. These photos were taken just before lockdown earlier in the year and construction has continued in spite of lockdown. So moving the collection, though, is a huge challenge in itself. And we decided that we couldn't do things the old way. We couldn't have people walking around with clipboards in our stores any longer. And that in um, 2020, as it now is, we needed to be taking a technology-driven approach. 
And what that enables is greater efficiency and greater accuracy as we move the collection. And it means we can capitalize on having to handle every object and digitize them as we go. Um, so what we're doing is attaching a barcode to um, a label attached to every object. And that is a reliable, unique identifier, um, better than um, traditional ways of managing data, which are very open to error when people type things into databases, scan a barcode. This is the technology that's been in use in warehouse management for many decades. Every package you get from Amazon has a barcode on it. And we're not the first museum to implement this by any stretch of the imagination. But we think the scale and the way that we're doing it is unusual because those barcodes are also driving activity in our collections management system and they'll also link to photography as we'll show you on the next slide. So that has meant a significant investment. We've put in Wi-Fi to achieve that and we've given our people handheld technologies um, as they work, work in our stores. But the net gains from that are massive. We've gone down from 15 minutes to inventory an object to four minutes. And if you multiply that by 300,000 objects, it's such a significant saving of people time, as well as actually making staff's lives much easier as, as they work on things. And we've taken the production line approach so that we resolve issues um, in a separate team to the team that's doing the processing. If they hit an object they can't deal with immediately, it gets passed over to an expert who will work on it and resolve whether it's a conservation question, a hazards question, a documentation question, so that the team who are just processing the stuff keep moving through um, at a real pace and we can get daily reporting and weekly and monthly reporting that shows us how things are going, where there might be problems emerging, and then step in and um, take action to keep things going. So this is a real game changer for us. Digitization as well is um, pretty impressive on this project. We are aiming for not a full photo studio image where we would historically have taken the object to the photo studio and our photographers would have spent up to an hour on it. We still do that if it's required for a really high resolution image for a poster or a book or whatever. But for now, we're aiming to get an object image that's good enough to go on our online collection platform. And the photographers have just five minutes with a kit that they take to the object. So they go up, set up in the store, put the objects in a light tent, they've only got three lights um, and they, they really whiz through the objects. But this is such a bonus, it means that we will be able to see what we've got but also share that with the public as well. And the really clever bit is that the barcode, the photographer scans the barcode and that is connected by the image metadata with the object record from the collections management system. So there's lots of clever technology behind the scenes that's taking out photographers processing time, whereas previously they would have spent something like eight minutes uploading the image and entering metadata based on the catalogue. That now all happens automatically and they can focus on taking the photos. Um, as I said earlier, this means we can be absolutely sure we know where everything is. We're moving so many objects and um, so many very special and precious objects that that's really, really vital. Um, we can also ensure that the whole collection has, has a hazard check and a condition check. And we're now moving on to commencing packing. And we um, just in the, the last couple of weeks, we've been implementing Axial's technology, Axial Move, because keeping track of the object locations as we pack objects into boxes, boxes into larger containers, put containers into crates, move those crates out to lorries, send them down the M4, and then reverse the whole operation at the other end. Um, it, the, the technology to do that for 300,000 objects is really, really key to making sure we, we keep track of everything and it actually gets unpacked onto the right shelves at the other end as well. Um, so I mentioned the online collection. The When we started, as I said, we had 5% of our objects online with an image. That's already gone up to 21% currently. And thousands more objects are going online every month. 
And the use of our online collection has more or less doubled uh, in the last year. Lockdown has a lot to do with that. And we genuinely believe this will be the world's greatest online science and technology collection by the time we're finished. The quantity and variety is unparalleled. Those objects don't just appear in a database, though. They also get used in stories that our curators are telling. Um, the current theme is about everyday technologies in the home. And um, so here you've got one of those stories and photos um, on in the middle and on the right that have been taken through the project. And our overall aim is that we inspire new audiences to discover our collection. People might not think there's something in the Science Museum group collection that's for them. I can absolutely guarantee there is. It's so varied and, and so big. And so more people than ever before will understand its relevance to their lives. Um, this is the new building nearing completion. I think what this project has shown me is that the sector can really benefit from grasping the opportunity that digital technologies offer. Um, it's enabled us to uh, know what we've got, know where it is, photograph it, get it up online, and that also share open data, which is going to be increasingly key going forward. We're really excited about the potential for other people to reuse our data and our images. We make them available under Creative Commons licenses. And the sector can really uh, benefit if it gets to grips with digital uh, access. And um, COVID-19 has shown that, that there's huge, huge potential here. Um, we don't, collections management was historically thought of as a bit dull, but actually, if you think of it as a way of making your collection accessible, suddenly that unlocks the opportunity to invest in it. Um, so that's a very brief overview of the Science Museum Group's move. Um, so the 300,000 objects start going down the M4 to Swindon next year. And um, that actually, the process takes a couple of years. So um, it will be 2024 probably by the time that we have the new facility set up and available for public tours. But the objects will be online way before that. And again, that's a real, real win. Um, I mentioned Axial Moves technology, and therefore I will hand over to Malcolm from Axial, and he will tell us a bit more about that and what it involves. Malcolm. Thanks, Jack. Um, okay, so Jack's outlined in, in some detail what this project is all about, but I want to give you some background to the piece of software and the technology that the museum is using to help enable the work in this project. And they're using something we call Axial Move. Now, Axial Move is an app that enables users to manage object movements quickly and accurately using an iPhone and barcode scanning technology. It integrates with the MIMSI collection management system used at the museum, and it's designed for managing large-scale relocation of collections, and this is a good example of, of, of that process. Now, as you can see from the screenshot, it's an app designed to work on smartphones, tablets, and, and mobile devices, so it's downloadable from the, the App Store. There is some configuration needed on the app, but essentially the application talks to a server which talks to the, the collection management system. And it's deployed either on premise or hosted, so it's pretty straightforward to set up and to, to use. Um, there is a login screen prior to the main menu, and authentication is done through the collection management system's permissions and security settings, but it is designed to be as simple as possible to use. And as Jack said, this is successfully tested by the museum. They've just started using it uh, live. The technology is used in a, a range of museums, both size-wise and geographies. But one interesting ap application, it's used in a, a shared storage facility that's used by four different museums using multiple collection management systems. So it's not tied into just work with Axial's collection management products. One technical point, though, it does just run with iPhones just now. There's a, the next version will be Android compliant as well, but at the moment it's an iPhone uh, tool. Now, you can see um, on the main menu options, it's not just about packing, moving, and unpacking objects. Um, you can use the application to call up object records and, and check or add selected detail. You can pull up a location and see what's currently or usually stored there. And there's also a task-based process as well, which is called Axial Missions. But I'll touch on that in a bit more detail uh, later. 
Uh, okay, so you can now see a, a typical record being retrieved in Move. You normally retrieve data by object number or barcode. And depending on the process you're running, you're presented with a choice at the bottom of the screen. And in this case, the main option is to pack this into a specific location. So the interface is quite clear and easy to, to use. But it integrates in real time with the collection management system to manage those movements. So it helps remove manual input and also the potential for any data errors. However, it does have an offline working mode. And as we know, network access, Wi-Fi is often a problem with storage that's off-site or, or remote or secure. So the ability to work offline can be quite important, or very important, in fact. And working offline, essentially, it's the same process as used working online, but then it synchronizes with the network when the network becomes available. And everything is time stamped and time recorded. So there's a clear timeline of events across different devices. And this all goes together to ensure the integrity of the, the data. Um, Okay, so in terms of data management, it allows you to manage data in a simple and safe way. And you can see in this screenshot, this record was retrieved, and I have the options to update the location or take a photograph of the object and upload that to the database as well. So, for example, you could access collections data on location. You could scan a barcode to access its records. You could add images, descriptions care instructions, and in, in insurance information of the object in front of you, so you know what you're dealing with and when. And as part of that configuration, you can define which fields you want to populate on the screen. Now, some of the things we're talking about with the, the Science Museum include um, hazard data. Now, a key piece of data for the teams to work with is hazard information, so they can pull so many details from the catalog. This is vital for the people when they're knowing how to approach an object for packing, for example. So we're looking to draw additional data from the hazard activity into the catalog so it's displayed on the app for the teams to, to use. They are displaying images, and that's very useful for the teams to work with, especially when there's doubt about the identity of an object. But they're not using it to capture images at this moment for this project, but that's a useful feature to use potentially for future uh, projects. Um, the, the MIMSI administrator, the collection management system administrator, can normally configure of what information appears and displayed on the screen using the admin module. But one thing the museum has requested is to change the way the counting mechanism works in the application, so they can indicate more clearly how many things are currently in a given location. And there's also some tweaks to the workflow as well, so you can choose to batch up a group of objects in one go, add notes or comments relative to them all, then upload those as one single batch. Because at the moment, any update of data is done on a per record basis. So the idea of take these five objects, add this note and comment to them all, and change them all now. And there's more flexibility in that process and also mitigates against any operator errors. So there's a lot of data management you can do through the application as well. But I mentioned at the start, there's another additional process called missions, which you've added, allows tasks to be assigned, worked on, and completed by staff. So the, the core system, if you like, is move, which scans, packs, unpacks, and moves. But additional functionality exists as well for downloading and completing tasks related to object movements. And you can see on this screenshot, as an example, there are three of these missions available for member of staff to accept. There's a loan request and two exhibitions they could choose to accept and then work with. And this is ideal for managing and tracking regular activity in an institution, you know, keeping track of day-to-day -day movement. So for example, requests to view things or to remove things urgently if there's risk of damage or to deliver to photography or, or conservation. So you create these tasks which need to happen at a particular time and then create jobs people can do when and where. And it's very useful for maybe staff or volunteers in stores or reading rooms or exhibitions. You can download the task, complete it in real time, and then mark it as done. So a useful way for assigning tasks to groups of people. And you can download these missions or tasks and complete them offline as well. So as I said at the start, um, Axial Move integrates with the management system to manage objects, locations, and if relevant, those tasks effectively and securely. But one of the core areas we're working on just now is trying to build on, on this, the workflow processes. 
And we're currently in beta with a new web browser-based workflow module that gives museums and institutions the ability to define their own workflows and business processes that are unique to their own institution. And there's more information about that in the virtual exhibitor area of the conference if you want to have a look at that um, a bit later on. But with that, I'm just going to hand back to, to Jack just to, to close and then um, take further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. And yeah, really to build on what Malcolm has said there, the customization has been really valuable for us. And um, the, the workflows are definitely the way forward for museums, I believe, very strongly. Um, in five or 10 years time, everyone will be doing it this way because the benefits of being able to track things, pass them between teams and so on in a workflow approach um, and, and report on um, where you're up to are immense. So the, we get regular reports um, that come up to me showing me what's going on. I can say, why is this high why is this low because museum collections are so varied there's often a reason to do with well this room's particularly difficult it's got these particular issues in but um we would never have been able to do this previously you just had to ask people how's it going and rely on a qualitative report whereas now you can pull off quantitative data um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I can see we've got one or two questions in the chat already. Um, and if people would like to ask more, please, please put them um, in now. Um, the, um, the first question we've got is in the new facility, what kind of storage or shelving are you installing? And the answer is quite a variety, but we've tried to go with standard types. So um, we're the smallest objects are going in cabinets, some of which we are actually bringing over from the existing facility where we've invested in storage furniture in the last 10 years and it's still good quality and, and reasonably modern and in good condition. Um, but so locked cabinets with um, a glass panel at the front so that you can see them and that's appropriate for trays of small objects like medical um, devices and so on. Um, next up is uh, open shelves, um, fairly standard shelving. Um, the, there, there's been a big procurement exercise to get us a good price on all this kind of thing. Um, one up from that is racking, um, so pallet racking, um, and that will account for the medium size objects, things like dentist chairs and so on. And then we are also introducing something that's unusual for museums, which um, is a sort of supersized pallet racking, which we'll be using for um, things like cars and bikes, because we've got so many of them that if we just put them on the floor, um, we'd need an even bigger building. And then we are using art mesh as well, actually, for some things that need to uh, that benefit from being um, vertically and some plan chests too. So we're using most types of storage and shelving, but each one of those locations will have a barcode associated with it. And that's a massive program in itself. Um, so there will be somebody who um, will go around and do the storage mapping, um, assign the barcode to the location. Those will all then be built up in the system, um, uh, in the facilities module of the, the collections management system so that there's a hierarchical structure. Um, and setting up that correctly in the first place is actually one of the most important bits of the process. Um, second question is, is probably more for Malcolm, and um, I suspect the answer isn't a simple price point, but what is the cost of the technology, Malcolm? Yes, well, the, the, in terms of the, the, the software, um, Axial Move is, is normally used in conjunction with an Axial collection management system. So a customer would normally already have acquired the, 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 the CMS, if you like. The actual cost of the, the move software is probably the, the least costly part of the process. Um, the key thing is the, the hardware to run it on. And customers would normally use um, smartphones, often with um, built-in um, scanners as well to make it easier to, 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 to read barcodes. You can use the camera on the phone to, to read the barcode, of course. Um, and also the, the, the barcodes as well. But the actual move technology is, is not that expensive, uh, assuming you're a, an axial collection management system user already. Normally based on a per device license. So you may choose to buy a license that allows 10 devices to connect to the move server at any one time. But it's just a, it's a per user 
to call. But it is not expensive technology, given the technology you need to use to, to run the software, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And the other thing I'd say is when you're looking at investing in this kind of thing, the calculation that I was able to do to demonstrate to my senior managers that it was worthwhile was to look at the cost of the minutes saved. And that's where there comes a tipping point where, yes, there will be some capital investment up front, but the the cost of people time that you're saving um, will outweigh that. If you're, And I think that's true even on a small scale because we're doing this on a massive scale clearly not many people have um, as big a move as us but um, even on a small scale you'll only be paying for a handful of licenses maybe maybe even just one or two and and yet you will get that benefit and also the accuracy benefit is very saleable from an audit and risk sort of perspective um our audit committee are very excited about this because they know it will um in, in ensure that we don't have any objects go missing or what we term not in place during this process um there's always room for human error but it's massively reduced when it's a barcode rather than someone looking up the right record and then updating it um, and possibly getting it slightly wrong, getting one digit out, getting the wrong part. Um, so so you, you you have to think of the benefits that the technology is giving when looking at the, the investment case um, as well as just the hard financial cost. Mm. And I think also as well as just being a, a device that allows you to to, to move and, and pack uh, items based on location, I think the more data management options that are built into it, the more useful it becomes. So as I said, for example, the ability to, to flag things on the database when you look at an object to take a picture quickly and feed that back automatically to the, to the, to the CMS is, is, a, is a really good feature. So it's not just about moving and packing. It's about data management as well. So there are, there are lots of benefits to the software. Yeah. Um, we've had one more collection uh, question, Malcolm. Will this software link with other known collections databases? Um, I mean, generally, our, these sort of add-on modules are designed to, to integrate seamlessly with, with our own products. That, 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 that's a given. Um, I do, as I said earlier, I do know of one instance in the Netherlands where um, there is at least one other collection management system that is... Um, taking advantage of the move technology as part of that shared storage service. I'm not sure if I can say who it is, but it certainly it, um, it, it, it does work. It is working with another. But I don't know how much of that was configuration by ourselves or configuration by the third party or required because of the shared storage facility. But generally, the technology, the move technology is, is used by those using actual collection management systems. I think as... What will happen is over the next few years is probably interoperability of data will increase that not necessarily of systems themselves, but um, the, the ability of systems to put out data in different formats and other systems to then pull that in um, is, is definitely on the rise already, I think, Malcolm. Yeah, absolutely. And the, 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 the key thing for for people like ourselves is is the strength of those public APIs that allow data to be to be pushed and pulled from systems. Um, so yes, this this is a device that allows people to interact with the, the collection management system itself. But the key thing is to make the the data in those systems more widely available through through linked data processes. And that's definitely the way that, that things are going. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Give it a minute to see if anyone would like to type something in. I think we've we've covered a good range of ground, though, um, and I, I hope the benefits of the approach we're taking come across. And we've put our um, ad email addresses on the slide there. So if there's anything that you think of afterwards or um, anything you don't want to ask in public, then please drop one or both of us a line and we'll be um, very, very happy to um, continue the conversation. Um, and um, as uh, Ian has said in the chat, um, thank you very much for attending and do go and enjoy the rest of the conference and the online exhibition as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.